Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. Ontario NDP MP Matt Kelway was born in Gatineau, raised in Kingston, and now lives in and represents the Toronto area riding of Beaches, East York. He studied in Canada and abroad, and it was in Glasgow that he met his American-born wife, Donna, who's now a Canadian Crown Attorney. Together they have three kids, and Matthew Kelway joins me now to talk about life beyond politics. Matt Kelly, welcome to Beyond Politics. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell our viewers where you're from, uh, where, what riding you represent. All right. Well, I come out of Beaches, East York, is the riding. I've been living in Toronto for 22 and a half years. I know that because I moved there the day after I got married, so I can't Did forget really? that day. Did you really? Oh, my gosh. No, you don't want to forget that. Was my, that was my honeymoon. Uh, to move? To move, yes. Wow. got married on Labor Day Sunday, packed the van on the Monday, and up here. Uh, so. Why'd you move? Oh, well, uh, so my wife's from Boston. Right. So we got married in Boston. Okay. We were both starting uh, school on the Tuesday following the Labor Day weekend. So, um, wow. Yeah. So we came you had to be there. Had to be there. So Was yeah. it a big wedding? It was. It wasn't as big as my in-laws wanted it to be. I think <laughs> I had uh, 20 guests and my wife had about 200. That sounds and like I, the usual division uh, of a wedding. Well, when it's out of town, right, for <laughs> out of country for, yeah. for my family, uh, it, uh, it became a bit lopsided. And um, Yeah, so my in-laws, I think, wanted about 400 people there all together, but we had to cut it down to size oh a bit. Oh, gosh. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm amazed that you were able to, after the stress of putting on a wedding that size, just maybe it was fleeing. Maybe you were fleeing yes, that, that to be sure right. new home. Let's get out of town. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, are you still living in the house that you moved into then? No, no, because we, you know, we were students. My wife was starting law school. I was starting graduate school, so we were renting a place. Right. And so... Uh, student accommodation you okay. know, so there have been a few apartments along the way before <laughs> For you. we moved into a home yeah. okay um, so where were where were you born then uh, just across the river in Hull Quebec oh, were you really yeah wow yeah. what were your parents doing there well um, I don't really know I, I'm adopted so okay. so uh, my biological mother was 16 presumably a student in school I wow. guess at that age and yeah. so um, yeah. So. How old were you when you were adopted? Oh, just a baby, like three months, something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've only ever known your um, yes. your adoptive parents. That's right. And were they from the Ottawa area, or were they also from... They're from there. Kingston. They were living in Kingston. Yeah. Yeah. What were they doing there? Teaching. Both, At both were teachers. Or? No, high school? Uh, high school teachers. My mother eventually went to Queens to teach at their faculty of education. Yes. But both high school teachers, yeah. Did you ever have either of your parents as a teacher? I did. Oh. I, I had my father for grade 13 English wow. and grade 11 English. Yeah. And not your mom? Not my mom because she, she packed in teaching in the school system at, yes. uh, when my brother and I were small and, and um, then went to, picked up her career at Queens later on. But yeah. What was so it just like my father. to be taught by your dad? Well, it's a bit weird, but I mean, he was a great teacher, and uh, so I didn't mind. I mean, when when you're the son of a teacher and you go to the school that they teach in, all the family friends are teachers at the school, so you're kind of used to knowing the teacher personally. Yes. You know, and it's a bit weird. You know, you have an essay to hand in, so you come down from your bedroom and put it on the kitchen table for dad. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so there's. Were you ever late? Did from time to time, really? yeah. What did he do? Yeah, well, nothing. No? No, he was pretty relaxed uh, about it, so, you know. Okay. He was a relaxed teacher, generally, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, not a big deal. Did he um, <clears throat> Did he ever find it awkward? Did he say that he found I it never, awkward? I never asked, and, and uh, I never got the sense that he did. Um, and uh, I mean, he he presumably could have had a choice as a, as a teacher about whose class I went into, um, but that's just what happened. You know, he taught my friends, he taught me. Yes. I don't think he ever taught my brother, but yeah. So it's just uh, didn't feel that weird at the time. Was your brother adopted too? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, what were you like as a kid? I don't, I don't know. Pretty normal. I, a normal kid. Uh, I think mostly uh, a quiet kid and not particularly uh, engaged in a lot of activities, but normal, you know, sports, yeah. music. You Studious? Know. Yeah. 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 Good student. What sports? Soccer, hockey, um, mainly. Yeah. yeah. Are you still sportive now? Not a sporty kind of guy, no. <laughs> <laughs> My wife uh, encourages me to do something. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's the one. It's the exercise piece that, that yeah. I haven't quite fit into the Ottawa schedule yeah. yet. Uh, I bet. So, yeah. Um, given the fact that your parents were both teachers, yeah. did that seem a natural career path for you? I contemplated uh, teaching at one point in time. I, I started out actually in architecture school. That's what I had wanted to do as a kid and all the rest of that. And, and then I, I uh, quit architecture. Why? Well, it's, it's, um, it's probably uh, uh, a couple things. One, the way architecture schools, like a lot of professional schools, run. And it's probably a personality thing, too. I mean, I, I remember... I started third year. In our very first project, um, a third of the class failed. A third of the class failed with like a zero, like it might as well have not come out. And then a third of the class passed the first project. I was one of those who got zero on my first project. So What's a zero? Why, well, why get a zero? They just say, <clears throat> you should not even have tried yeah. this, you're so bad at it? Or Yeah, I don't, I don't understand it uh, that's, myself. A zero so, is a pretty... Yeah. So I, I went to speak to, to the, uh, the director of the school at the time and said, you know, I've been here now two years, so what, what's this about? And uh, he said, well, I know they're running it like a boot camp, but there's nothing I can do. So uh, at that point I said, well, I'm going to go off and do something else. So Even though I you left. had given those two years over to the study? Yeah, but, you know, I, I had the sense at that point in time that um, – that there were other things I wanted to do, and I certainly didn't want to commit another three years to an environment where you were treated in a kind of arbitrary fashion that right. didn't make any kind of sense. Uh, you know, your question, like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> so yeah. It's like, yeah, what does that mean? So I'm going to submit myself for another three years to to uh, this system where um, it, it didn't make any sense. So I said, that's I'm, I'm leaving here. Yeah, where'd you yeah. go? I went to Britain, actually, um, and uh, worked in London for a couple months with a cousin who had a, a painting company, and then I went so out So you to painted houses? Yeah. And then I went out to the west coast uh, of Wales to a little town, uh, very remote, called Newquay. Uh, they had 600 regular uh, folks, citizens of the town of Newquay there in the winter, so very quiet, but, but seven pubs. And um, and come summertime, then tourists flooded in. Right. Right. So I had a to uh, populate the pubs. To populate the pubs. Yes. <laughs> so I, I had a, a couple of months of uh, very quiet time behind the bar in in the Black Lion pulling pints, and then uh, a very busy summer, uh, and so uh, a lot of time to uh, to reflect on what what I was going to do uh, next. Tell me also about the kind of people that you were meeting, because when you're painting people's houses, you're going yeah. right into their homes, yeah, yeah. and you're seeing how they live their lives and the way yeah, yeah. they treat their kids and how they are as people. Yeah. And when you're sitting or standing behind a bar, yeah. you're also seeing a whole other side of humanity, good yeah. and bad. Yeah. What did it teach you about people? Or about well, yourself, you know, the, the, painting, uh, the painting business, uh, I, I actually never saw anybody. People were out during that the day, and, you know, you're in painting their homes and stuff. And, uh, but, but the pub stuff is, was, was a fascinating experience because it was really a little world unto itself, this town of Newquay. And, um, and so nights during the winter time were spent chatting with locals in front of the fireplace. I mean, I remember my first night working there. And uh, the the landlord, who was a kind of 
second cousin or something had gone out to do second uh, cousin to you yeah to me had gone out to to participate in local pantomime that they were putting on and so left me with the bar <laughs> with the bar in this like little ho hotel did and, you have any training i had no training and, did and you know I, what alcohol was which i or were you just doing pints well yeah you know you you you, you well, mostly pints. Okay. But the great thing about drinking in Britain, at least at that time, is like the most, the more it got as complicated as gin and tonic, okay. right? And and so if somebody asked, the great thing about being a bartender, if somebody asked for something more yeah. complicated, there was no embarrassment in saying, like, what, what is that and how do you make that, right? So it's not like fancy drinks and cocktails and stuff. So, so it's very simple. But but the first night he went out and left me with some locals and and uh to show me the ropes if someone wanted a part, they, they came behind the bar and showed me and oh okay so that's interesting so were it, they so, respectful yeah they were lovely okay. yeah no it was, it was a wonderful experience and it was uh it's the kind of town my cousin grew up there uh from the age of like three or four uh, but and, and at this time he was in his 40s had brought his family up in the town but he still was not considered a local right I mean it's that kind of right. town like you either right. came from there and you went back generations or you weren't from there and, and so it, it was uh, but it was lovely to be embraced by the locals and become part of their uh, little community um, and uh, it was a, it was um, a great experience and then and then well one of the interesting things about working there is that that word spreads that you know there's a Canadian behind the bar and at the Black Lion and and so and it became a tourist destination well no not a tourist destination but a local destination so people came from like you know far and wide to see and, and meet the Canadian behind the bar and and so there was a lot of women who came and and uh, see the Canadian behind the bar and stuff because like of your that. cute so, accent well I don't know what they were <laughs> expecting um, but um, undoubtedly disappointed when they arrived but nevertheless they came no. and, and it was um, yeah so it was a great experience and then the summer comes and and the place gets populated and it's six deep at, at the bar and and uh and that in and of itself is a, is a totally different uh, experience. But I enjoyed it both. And, and for, for, I think, for me, for a regular, uh, really kind of a, a shy, more quiet person, um, it was a great experience mm -hmm. to be behind the bar and, and, and um, have to live up to the expectations that when co someone comes in and takes a seat and has a pint that... You have to initiate the conversation. You, you, yeah, you talk to them and yeah. you get to know people. And it was, it was fascinating. And, and the town was full... Of very interesting characters like Dylan Thomas spent some time there um, very briefly but his little cottage was up there with bullet holes still in the wall there's some incident going on there and he used to come down to the black line and drink and and the town was full of, uh, one of his essays quite early one morning was written about uh, the town um, and and so you you meet some of these characters right Barry Beamswinger lived in the town he's man who tried to hang himself right hence Barry Beam Swinger and and Die Milkman was in the town and and uh and so you meet some of the locals that that uh, were written about and the like fascinating that must have been. fascinating characters and it was wonderful to get to know them and and become part of their community you know so so that was great you would have known that you had to make a decision about what you wanted to do next did yeah. that weigh heavily on you <clears throat> Not heavily, um, never far, I guess, from my mind. But um, and and I I think I knew that come September the following year I kind of had to make a move. I wasn't going to to make my life there in in New Key. Um, and so I I ended up um, returning to Kingston and getting into to Queens because I had you know family could help a mm. place to live. Yeah. Really Did you live at home? Yeah, so when I returned to Queens for my first year, I went back to live at home with my parents because uh, I kind of landed on the eve of school starting that year, and um, it was really the only way to kickstart a, a school uh, kind of academic uh, yeah. exercise. Yeah. Were they concerned, your parents? I think they were concerned while I was away, um, and I think they were concerned about me leaving architecture. Uh, because it'd been something I'd been thinking about as and wanting to do since since I was a kid, and I I think they liked the idea of me becoming an architect. But but um, 
mostly, uh, you know, my mother was extremely supportive. She said, you, you'll succeed at whatever you want to do and, and uh, do what makes you happy and blah, blah, blah. But I don't think they wanted to see me hanging out in Newquay, uh, West <laughs> Wales forever either. Pulling so pines for the rest <laughs> of your life. Pulling pines for my future, yes. So, um, yeah. So uh, I, th- I think they, they were probably concerned. At one point, they sent my brother over to check up on me uh, to make sure I was, you know, I guess alive and happy and all the rest of that sort of stuff. So that was that was fine. That, so uh, when you got back, what did you study? Uh, political that, science or okay. political studies, as they called it at Queens, is sure. what I what I went into. Yeah. Why? Because that's so different from architecture. Yeah. And had yeah. you come from a political? No. Politically active family? No, and, and I think it was a bit of a reaction to architecture. So later on, to, to skip ahead, I, w- I went to the University of Glasgow, and right. I, I remember studying in, in the, the Adam Smith Library there at Glasgow and reading some German sociologist. And there was this term, um, socially segregated universe of meaning, and I read that, and I thought that's what I thought at the time, at least, about architecture. I thought there was this strange thing that I, as, as a, a young guy, could never figure out. You know, some people said, well, your bathroom's too close to the wall. That's not going to work. And other people didn't have bathrooms in their houses. And and I, I never really got onto it. But I, but, okay. but I ended up with the, the, the thought when I was studying architecture and reflecting back on those years that it wasn't really somehow a socially meaningful thing to be doing. Okay. And so, and th- this is my thinking at the time. Yes. Um, and, and, and I don't think that way about architecture anymore. No, but, but I understand but that for yeah. what you mean for you as an individual, yeah. how, it, yeah. how it felt to you at yeah. that time. So my reaction to all of that was to say, you know what, what matters, I thought, to, <laughs> to people, and, and the way this world works and turns is, is uh, political science. That is um, uh, the, the antithesis of socially segregated, and, and um, so I wanted to go study that. So that's what I did. Why Glasgow? Oh, I was anxious to get out of Kingston. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I well, you, you know, keep choosing I, these places that are not. It's not like I'm Toronto. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, yeah, no. So I, I love being in Britain, right? And I had such a great time at, at, in pulling pints in the pub, and and um, and. I, I was kind of reluctant to come home. I mean, coming back to Kingston was the only thing that was really feasible in order to get back into that school year uh, again. But as soon as I arrived, I mean, I grew up in Kingston, mm-hmm. right? And I grew up with with uh, the whole Frosh Week stuff, and and was, and so um, I went back to Kingston and Queens a bit reluctantly, frankly. And so I was anxious for opportunities to go back out and study and travel at the yeah. same time and at the time Queens had uh, given its Scottish roots it had uh, uh, an opportunity to go to St. Andrews and then it had this exchange program with Glasgow University and so I applied uh, to go to Glasgow and, and, uh, and so that's where I went for my third year. And you met your wife? Yes, yeah, yeah. I met my wife who was on exchange from the University of Massachusetts and um, and as it happens, you know, when you're in, in uh, other countries, people of similar backgrounds, the Canadian students, the American students, kind of ended up as foreign students there, hanging out a lot. And yeah. so I met Donna, and um, we were engaged, I think, in th- three months. And no kidding. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. fast. It is, yeah. So you got engaged over there. Yes. Did you both know immediately? I think so, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I guess immediately three months, yeah, yeah. kind of, uh, yeah. So explain to me the reaction on both sides with both sets of parents yeah. when they had sent their children off to uh, yeah. go to school and all of a sudden they get engaged. And had, had her parents met you yet when you announced your engagement or vice versa? Yeah, so we got engaged in Ireland actually because um, at the spring break over there, her parents had come over to Ireland. They, they were from Ireland originally. And uh, and so Donna went over to Ireland at spring break um, to meet them there and spend a week. And the plan was for me, I had another exam to write, so I followed uh, over to Ireland a few days later and so met them uh, met them there. And that's where we got engaged was in, in Ireland, actually. And, um, yeah, my, my, uh, my mother-in-law's only question, I had to speak to her in the, in the coal shed, and her only question is, are you going to bring the kids up as Catholics? That was, that was it. 
And so I, I assured and you, you her said I would. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, then you may be a part of our yeah. family? Yes. And then, uh, <laughs> that was it. And, of course, they were quite skeptical because I had no ring for Donna at the time, right? We were on our way to Amsterdam. Right. And, and, uh, and so the, my plan was to, to get a ring diamond in Amsterdam, and which is what we did right. uh, after we left They weren't Ireland. content with the tinfoil ring that you yeah, gave her? Yeah, well, I didn't even go through any pretense <laughs> of rings. I'm not a, you know, I, I was not a material young man. These things don't matter. This is love, right. so who needs a ring, Yeah, right? until your mother-in-law said. They were said. like, yeah, <laughs> until there's a ring. You will this, bring them up Catholic, and count. there will be a diamond. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. right. So, so uh, we went to, to Amsterdam, and uh, we, we got a ring with a diamond in it, a very small diamond, which my wife has never let me forget, um, but which she lost actually two weeks ago, I think. So oh. it finally fell out of its settings. So. I'm sorry to hear that. But, but hopefully okay. it can be replaced with something I, much I, larger yes. to represent the significance. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's a way to do that. Yeah. At what stage did you decide, outside of the academic interest in political science, that you wanted to pursue a career in politics? Because if I understand it, you joined yeah. the NDP when you were in... Yeah, yeah, much, much younger. Yeah, yeah, never, never, kind of an activist NDP, or but it was certainly the the party of choice uh, for me. Always has been, and um, uh, and I don't, I don't think I ever actually made a decision that I wanted a career in politics. Um, I ended up uh, choosing to run in two thousand and eleven. Actually, in the summer two thousand and nine, when the kind of alert went out, we need candidates. Could be a fall election. I was uh, president of the local NDP Riding Association mm -hmm. at the time, chairing the search committee for a candidate, and um, ended up through that process uh, to run myself for the nomination. So we had a nomination contest for five months, and then I was the candidate for 15 months before the rate eventually dropped. Your wife um, has a busy career of her own. Yes. She's a crown attorney. Yes. And you have little kids. Yes. Uh, what was the general reaction when you said, yeah. not just that you wanted to be, yeah. you know, president, continue yeah. your role, president of the uh, uh, of the writing association, but that you thought you might put your name forward too? Yeah. So um, we had that conversation uh, at home first to make sure there was uh, support for the idea of running. I don't know that any of them contemplated. We we did discuss the possibility of winning, but. Um, I don't know how real that was in anybody's <laughs> mind, mind at the time. Yeah. So, so we did have that conversation, and and the kids. Uh, so right now I've got a 16, 14, and nine year old, and so uh, t you know we're going back two years uh, plus, actually almost four years now, right? So, so how how much, um, how real that conversation right. was with the kids? I, I don't know, but I did ha I did talk to them about it. Um, and certainly talked to Donna about it, and, and she was very supportive of uh, me taking a crack at, at running anyway. So, Do you think she was supportive because she didn't think you'd win? <laughs> I know, perhaps. <laughs> um, I, I think she was supportive because, um, because I th our politics are the same. Yeah. And, and uh, I think she understood why... I wanted to run and, and understood the importance of somebody running who was going to put a lot of work into it and, mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what I was prepared to do. Um, and uh, so I, I, you know, I, think she, I think she got why it was important to right. me to, to do that. So. When you won, um, apparently one of your children said, "That's just crazy talk." Yeah, yeah, my <laughs> son. Yeah. So when I say, you know, when I explain, you know, the people of Beaches East York have chosen me to go to Ottawa to represent them. <laughs> that was his response. Well, that's just crazy talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, out of the amounts of because he kids. thought you were you were crazy, or because he thought that this was just a crazy situation for the whole family. Uh, well. Or, or he could have thought the people of Beaches East York were crazy. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not too sure what it was, but uh, yeah, no, I, I guess what he what he would, and I think it's more the latter that that you know, Dad, um, that people would ask Dad to 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 go and do that for yeah. him. I thought he, he, he said, well, <laughs> that didn't make much sense to him. I think is what he was saying. Do they like it now? Uh, how do they how do they feel about it now? I think they're I think they're conflicted. 
the girls are. There's my oldest two, 16 and 14. I, I think um, uh, there are good parts and bad parts to yeah. it for them. You know, and, yeah, I've got uh, to imagine for a 14 and a 16 year old girl having your dad in any kind of position yeah. where people know him. Yeah. Uh, when they're ashamed to yeah. pretend that they know you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's got to be really tricky. And always, always nervous that you're going to do or say something. Right. I remember at, at the um, convocation last last um, fall for the local high school, the, the school that mm -hmm. my girls go to now, Malvern. And so they ask me, uh, the MP, every year to give a little speech uh, convocation. So, so I, uh, I said something about YOLO. You only live once, right? And and um, in in the course of, of my speech, and and uh, I think it was people thought it was pretty funny. And some kid in the audience tweeted that, right? And, of course, and so my daughter, who was out of town at the time, um, gets a tweet from a kid at school, something about. You know, MP Kelway or something said this at at and immediately got a text message from my daughter, Dad. What did you say? <laughs> you know, it's, so there, there's always, I think, that kind of nervousness about, uh oh, what's Dad going to do or yeah. say next that's going right. to embarrass me, right? I think they're getting a little more comfortable with it because I don't think I've done anything uh, to to embarrass them in a. In a Major in a major way. way. <laughs> so, so that's Still okay. Still got time. Yeah. So those are the girls. My my yeah. son, who's nine, has I, I think a different reaction, and 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 I think doesn't appreciate uh, this this life, um, and so uh, it's I, be I don't think he he sees the the, the upside no. <laughs> this, <laughs> from his perspective. Yeah. No. And it is. It is. I mean, that's the word I would use. Every every. Uh, you know, Sunday night at bedtime, it is it is bit wrenching for for both of us um, yeah. to to say goodbye for the week and and uh, yeah. You drive. Yes. Yeah, you drive between Ottawa and Toronto. Most, Why do you do most that? of the time? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Why? Well, um, my mother lives in Kingston mm -hmm. on route there, and so my it's it's an opportunity for me to stop in and see her. Uh, there's very little opportunity for the family to come down to Kingston and spend a weekend or for my mom to come up uh, to Toronto. I mean, the life on weekends for us as MPs are just chock-a-block yeah. full of events, right? And so so I uh, leave home at like 5.30 on a Monday morning and I have breakfast with mom in Kingston at 8. And then um, and it's, it's usually kind of a flying breakfast but yeah. uh, the home she lives in the seniors home um, the the women who work there uh, know what I'm having for breakfast <laughs> when I arrive <laughs> and it's bang 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 and and, uh, and so we have a chat and, and catch up and yeah and, and you know 45 minutes later I'm, I'm back on the road and and yeah. uh, and in Ottawa in the morning which is great and Thursday nights uh, it's a similar routine where sure. I stop in just before bedtime oh. um, and, and say hi and catch up and then continue the journey. So. You seem to have made a really um, <coughs> incredible effort to uh, to manage the balance between family mm -hmm. and professional. And I appreciate that you would take the time to be here today, too, because well, I know it's a busy schedule and you try to jam-pack everything in. Well, pleasure, pleasure, and I appreciate your effort to, to make us a little more human for well, her. It's, <laughs> for it's a great pleasure for me, too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm.